Welcome everyone. I am Elizabeth Cowell, the University Librarian at UC Santa Cruz. Thank you so much for joining us this evening on International Women's Day. Before we begin, I would like to share a few details about the event tonight. We are using a webinar tool. There will be no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer some of your questions at the end of the program. And so we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Also, tonight's event will be recorded. So let's get started. First, you'll hear from Chancellor Cindy Larive, who will describe how our incredible two speakers will be honored in our science and engineering library. I will then give you more context about how this all came about and what we hope will be the impact of this naming. We also hope to inspire others to join us in completing this exciting project. Let's hear from Chancellor Larive. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and welcome, everyone. I'm delighted that you are able to join us for what promises to be an inspiring conversation with our two most noteworthy scientists, Professor Emerita of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Sandra Faber, and scientist and UCSC alumna, Catherine Sullivan. It's not an exaggeration to say the resumes and accomplishments of both of these women are unmatched. Elizabeth will offer more detailed introductions in a few minutes, but I'm honored to note that Sandy is a pioneering astrophysicist whose work has proven fundamental in our understanding of the evolution and formation of galaxies. Kathy is a scientist, astronaut, and an administrator whose career has greatly advanced the causes of science and education. They are women and scientists who I deeply respect and admire. Their affiliation with our campus is an endless source of pride for me and for our entire campus community. And it's also fortunate that Sandy and Kathy will be in conversation tonight with our own Beth Shapiro, an incredible scientist in her own right. Beth is an evolutionary molecular biologist and a leader in the field of ancient DNA. Needless to say, this promises to be a very interesting evening one that I'm glad to point out is happening during Women's History Month when we're recognizing and celebrating the vital role of women in US history. I'm also excited because tonight is the first time we are publicly announcing that two floors in our science and engineering library will be named in honor of our guest speakers, Sandy and Kathy. The transformation of the third floor of the science and engineering library was completed right before the pandemic hit in early 2020. The floor is now named the Sandra M. Faber floor. Meanwhile, we've begun work to transform the first floor of the library as well. The floor will open in the winter quarter of 2022 and will proudly bear the name of Catherine D. Sullivan. Congratulations to both of you, Sandy and Kathy, this is richly deserved and an important step towards making our library more inclusive as we transform it into a library of the 21st century, embracing books as well as digital scholarship and giving our students a library that fits their needs. Elizabeth will talk a little bit about this transformation as well. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening and I'll turn it back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Chancellor. After the great success of the renovation of McHenry Library on campus, we reached out to STEM students, science, technology, engineering, and math in 2019 and asked them about their experience as members of the campus community. We discovered that of those we interviewed, many simply didn't know where to find the necessary services, academic support, and a place of community on campus. Many did not see a clear path to a career. Being the first in their family to go to college or being a young woman, they express concerns about their future. We had the chance to transform our science and engineering library and in doing so address these concerns directly. By hosting advising, tutoring and student support services in the library where students already gather, we aim to make it easier for them to find mentorship and make use of a number of vital student success resources alongside library services. 
add in access to state-of-the-art technology, and we are creating a library that holistically prioritizes student success. I strongly believe that a library can be a powerful equalizer on campus. We can be a place that transforms a culture, a place that dares to lead in campus efforts to make sure we are an institution that walks the walk. So with the help of our generous donors, Alec and Claudia Webster of the Helen and Will Webster Foundation, we decided to name two floors in honor of two groundbreaking scientists. Thank you so much, Claudia and Alec, for your transformational support of the University Library. It was their wish to name the library floors in honor of these women who broke glass ceilings before the term glass ceiling even became a popular term. Our amazing honorees and speakers today, Sandra Faber and Catherine Sullivan, forged an incredible path in male-dominated professions years ago. Sandy Faber is an astrophysicist known for her research on the evolution of galaxies, but maybe not everyone knows that in 1972, she joined the faculty of Lick Observatory at UC Santa Cruz and became the first woman on that staff. In 1976, she observed the relationship between the brightness and spectra of galaxies and the orbital speeds and motions of the stars within them. The law that resulted would become known as the Faber-Jackson relation. She has accumulated an incredible list of accomplishments. And Kathy Sullivan, who as a young woman started as a literature major at UC Santa Cruz, decided one day, somewhat reluctantly, to take a biology class. A, de a decision that changed her life. The class set her on a path not only to become the first woman to American woman to walk in space, she recently also became the first woman to descend to the deepest spot in the world's oceans, the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. Similar to Sandy, her accumulation of accomplishments, awards, and honors is too long to list. By naming the science and engineering library floors in honor of these two groundbreaking scientists, we hope to inspire a new generation of UCSC graduates and prevent them from being held back by society's common prejudices. When our students think of an oceanographer or an astronaut, we want them to envision a woman. When they think of a faculty researcher, we want them to see a person of color or someone who is first in their family to go to college. We want every student to know UC Santa Cruz is a place where everyone can reach their full potential, no matter what their background, gender, or race. I am so excited to introduce both Sandy Faber and Kathy Sullivan as our featured speakers. Please also join me in welcoming our moderator, Beth Shapiro. Professor Beth Shapiro is an evolutionary biologist who specializes in the genetics of Ice Age animals and plants. She is a 2009 MacArthur Fellow and an award-winning popular science author and communicator who uses her research as a platform to explore the potential of genomic technologies for conservation and medicine. Welcome Beth, Sandy, and Kathy, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And now let me take a little bit of time to welcome you again to today's exciting event where we're going to celebrate the careers and achievements of these two impressive women scientists. And of course, make official the naming of the first and third floors of our science library for them. I have prepared a few questions for Kathy and Sandy, and I'll also be taking questions from the audience. So ask away, we'll be looking through your questions as we speak and picking only the best ones. So make sure they're good questions. <laughs> it is particularly pleasing to me that this dedication is taking place on March 8th, which is not only the beginning of Women's Month, the month for celebrating women and our achievements, but also International Women's Day. I didn't think this was the plan, although we're lucky that this is the actual date. And so on that note, I'm going to begin with a question that's relevant to International Women's Day. Both of you are pioneers in your fields, gender notwithstanding, but there must have been moments where your gender played a pivotal role, either in making specific opportunities available to you or less happily perhaps, meaning that barriers were in place that you needed to overcome. 
Kathy, your biography includes lots of lines in which you're the named the first woman to achieve lots of things. First woman to walk in space in October, 1984. First woman to dive to the deepest parts of the oceans. What are some of the barriers that you discovered along the path to these many impressive firsts that may have been specific to your gender? Thanks for the question, Beth. Uh, you know, I, I led a blessed life, I think, in that regard. It came along enough after earlier pioneers who went before me uh, that the door to some of the fields that I was going into, I, I wouldn't say it was wide open, but it wasn't nailed shut anymore. Uh, others before me had you know, broken it down and gotten it ajar at least. But I did find first that as a geology student where the sort of the cutting edge thing is going out into the field up into the mountains or wherever it may be uh, and being in field camp for maybe weeks at a time and then on research ships. Uh, and the issue was I think two things. Those have been fun cool boys camps you know from time immemorial. Uh, and the, you know, the guys could do whatever they wanted to do, what, whatever that might be, they tell raunchy jokes or belch or hang around in their underwear, whatever it might be, you know, be little boys again. And now there's gonna be a woman here that's gonna make them feel more self-conscious about that. Uh, so that seemed to always get condensed to, uh, I mean, their pushback was the problem is we don't know where you will go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, to which my normal recourse was, that's not A, that's not your problem. Uh, B, I, I understand trees and rocks, this will be just fine. And aboard ship, you know, the, no toilet aboard ship knows the gender of the hand that pushes. It. So I think the toilets will work just fine. Uh, the other thing seemed to be that issue about the, you know, the boys camp, just a boys camp. Uh, and the second thread seemed to tie back to their own marriages. Uh, so maybe there already was a bit of tension with their spouse about being at sea for a while or at field camp for a while. But the sense I got was, well, at least she wasn't worried about whether I was fooling around. But now that you'll be here, you know, I have this other problem. Uh, and again, my primary answer was, that would be your problem, not mine. <laughs> so, I, you know, a little bit of ignorance is bliss can go a long way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, interesting. Uh, I think we've all experienced a little bit of that, the, the field camp issues and, and yes, um, I end up feeling self-conscious in these situations, but it's not necessarily my problem, right? Sandy, have you experienced anything similar? Well, yeah, and it's interesting. I guess it could be summed up as to um, an invasion of turf. That, uh, and I had a sort of a, a parallel situation. But first of all, I'd like to start by saying that like you, I felt that there had been women before me. It wasn't, I was not the first. And as a result, the, as you say, the, the door was definitely ajar. But um, there was a, a last bastion in astronomy, which was famous for it not being gender neutral. And that was Palomar and Mount Wilson Observatory, biggest telescopes in the world. And when I was a graduate student, my advisor managed to get time on both of these. And we went to Mount Wilson first. And their um, astronomers stayed in a building that was called, frankly, the monastery, sending the message, right? And uh, I couldn't stay in the monastery for obvious reasons. So I slept on the gatekeeper's sofa in his cup. Hmm. Uh-oh. Oh no, <laughs> we've lost Sandy. I guess she will have to rejoin our, <laughs> our party in just a moment. I will move to another question then. Um, Kathy, we are all here because of our association with UC Santa Cruz. So I'd like to learn a bit more about how you chose UCSC. My understanding is that you came here as an undergraduate because UC Santa Cruz has a strong or had a strong Russian language program, um, but you didn't end up becoming a linguist. So how did this change happen? That's exactly why I came to Santa Cruz, plus the affordability of the University of California system. Uh, my theory of the case at the time was that I needed to find a path that built on some of my known strengths, and foreign languages were one, uh, that in a nutshell would result in somebody buying me airplane tickets so I could travel to and study and live in other parts of the world. I'd been a map fanatic from my youngest days, just hugely curious about everything about the earth, geography, landscape, climates, peoples, cultures, politics, you name it. So the flair for languages seemed to be, you know, the first 
good key to unlocking that kind of a world. Uh, so here I come to Santa Cruz and I sign up for a bunch of language courses, Cal College, the World Civilization Core course. Uh, and I'm meeting with my advisor, who's John Hummel, a professor of French literature, delightful guy. He, he remained my undergraduate advisor for all four years, despite my change of major, because we enjoyed each other's company so much. And he informed me in our very first meeting, uh, you know, I looked through the catalog. I had a whole roster of classes that was locked and loaded and ready to take. And he informed me that I had to give up one third of those because I had to take one natural science course each of the three quarters. Uh, I threw every argument and, and tantrum, everything short of tears at him to get out of this. And of course failed. Uh, but the fun thing was, you know, John, John had nursed other language majors through this problem before. And so he had scouted courses in the natural sciences faculty that were interesting and well-taught and not too hard for French majors. And so he recommended three to me. One of them was Todd Newberry's Introduction to Marine Biology. So that was the first quarter, uh, fall quarter. Uh, there was for me a very forgettable uh, theoretical mathematics course in the second winter quarter. And then the third one was Gary Griggs' uh, overview of oceanography in the spring quarter. And I was just mesmerized by Todd's course, you, this ebullient dynamic young professor in love with his field, taking us out to the shoreline every weekend. Uh, and the contrast to you know, my econ prof and John with nice cozy offices, slightly darkened pipe on the rack, dog on the floor, or out in the shoreline or up in the mountains with Casey and, and, uh, and Todd was kind of, it was pretty, pretty irresistible. So the pivotal moment, and, and I'll tell the stories because to me it's really symbolic of the, the commitment to, to reaching out and supporting and educating undergraduates at Santa Cruz. I'm not quite 18 years old. I'm still a declared language major. I, these two classes have fascinated me. And I worked up the courage to go up to Gary after class one day. And, and I didn't put any of this very intelligently. I essentially said, Todd's course was interesting and you, I'm loving this stuff. I don't even quite really know why. So I don't know if I just found my lifetime hobby or something more. And what, what, what does it mean? What do you guys do? What, you know, what does be an oceanographer mean besides lecture to freshmen? And you, know, to, you gotta pick the right person if you're gonna put a question that poorly because instead of dissing me as he well could have done for a very poorly put question, he heard what was underneath it. And he responded to the interest and the passion, the unformed interest underneath it, invited me up to his lab the following Saturday and spent you know, three quarters of a day fielding one after another equally badly put questions and you're hauling out a map or hauling out a sample or putting something under the microscope. And the conclusion was I asked him, what should I take next quarter? I'm good at languages. I know I could succeed in some kind of life. I don't know if I'm any good at this what class should I take next quarter to find out if I can actually handle this? Uh, so my, in a nutshell, where I think most professors would have looked down their nose at my ignorant question and sort of reminded me how huge the chasm was between their respectable tenured self and my you know, modest little 17 year old arts major, uh, Gary showed me how to build a bridge across that chasm and welcomed me to the other side. And that's why I am where I am today. No it's amazing. It's a great story. Do you remember <laughs> right. what he told you to take? Oh, goodness. Yes, I do. Because it almost killed me. <laughs> it was an optical mineralogy course. And so the, there I go the next quarter and Rob Coe gets up day one and he writes, he writes some things on the board and he turns around to the class, all of whom he thinks were intending to be science majors in high school, I suspect. And he says, well, this simple expression will be the basis of everything we do this year. I copied that expression like I was imitating his handwriting because I had no idea what it was. And I ran to the bookstore, uh, the Bay Tree bookstore and bought the book he said was the course book. And then I went over to the other part of the bookstore and found the you know, trigonometry for, for dummies because I had never taken trig in high school. So I, my, my modest claim, my not very modest, one of my points of modesty is that I passed Rob Coe's course without ever having taken trig formally and got through. And what was the equation? Snell's law. I mean, how, you oh, know. okay. <laughs> All right. So, so completely simple. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Welcome back, Sandy. Hopefully we will not have any more bugs. Uh, I think I, I solved the problem. I think it's okay. <laughs> it wouldn't be an online seminar if we didn't have something like this happen, right? That's At least uh, once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back to your question because I'm really interested to hear the answer. We were talking a little bit about hurdles that you have to face specifically because of your gender. And I think the, the question that I I'm really interested in is, you, you know, you're such a prominent person and, and everyone is clear about how smart you are and how, how much of a leader in your field you are. Uh, so was there ever a time where you felt like you were taken less seriously just because of your gender? Um, it's hard for me to remember that, actually. I, I certainly have encountered issues over gender, but yeah, I think I have a bad habit, and that is just an irrepressible desire to speak up all the time. My problem is that I'm not, I don't know when to shut up. And um, as a result, I, I'm, I'm a little, um, I'm not backward about coming forward, and I just speak up, and people have paid attention, for which I'm very grateful. Uh, however, I could answer your question in a real way, though. First of all, I wanted to finish my story about Palomar. Um, we, we moved from Mount Wilson to Palomar. They also had a monastery. And when I walked in the front door, at least I could sleep there. When I walked in the front door, there was a stairway and there was uh, a uh, velvet, red velvet rope across the bottom of the stair with a big, a, not a small, a big sign that said, female upstairs. And that was my room. And that's because the bathrooms were shared between adjoining bedrooms. And so I had to have the entire top floor of the monastery to myself in order to be safe and secure in, in that location. Uh, but really what I wanted to do was to, was to launch off that to say that shortly after that, of course, I became, as you said, the first female staff member at Lick Observatory. And this is a, an occasion for me to say two things. First of all, the, the big barrier that I faced by virtue of gender was that I got pregnant right away. And so I had to deal with being an assistant professor and a pregnancy at the same time. But then the second thing I wanted to say was how incredibly wonderful it was at Lick Observatory dealing with this. And, uh, I remember the director, Bob Kraft, there were no UC pregnancy leave policies at the time. And so I told him that I was expecting, in fact, I was pregnant as I walked in the door on January 1st, 1972. And um, I told him I was gonna be pregnant and I needed to make some arrangements. What, what, you know, what was the rule? Well, there wasn't a rule. There had never been any such thing before. And he said, we don't have any policies. And so therefore what I'm telling you is you take as much time as you need for this and we will ask no questions whatsoever. It's completely up to you. You may do as you wish and there will be no questions asked afterwards. And that kind of set the tone for my whole appointment at Lick Observatory. I can honestly say I have never felt not even one second of gender discrimination from any of my colleagues at the observatory or at Santa Cruz for that matter. So I think we have a wonderful institution here and it has certainly made me feel at home. That's a beautiful story, really great news. Of course, there are lots of women who don't have this sort of fortune in the jobs that they have. And so I do think it's a reason that we should be happy and celebrate. He was a, he was a wonderful director. <laughs> A humane person. Okay, I am going to go back to Kathy because I have left myself here a little bit confused and possibly also the rest of the audience. Um, we started as a linguist and then we moved into oceanography. But of course, what everyone thinks of when they think of Kathy Sullivan is the astronaut who walked in space. So how did you tell us a little bit about this second transition? How did the conversion from oceanographer to astronaut take place? Well, it's testament to my inclination as an explorer. Every, every time I hit a major juncture of finishing high school or college or grad school, 
I think I was more open than sometimes people are to looking beyond the natural linear next step at other options that might be out there. Uh, the switch to, from oceanographer to astronaut has two pieces to it. One is rather of my doing and the other is very much not. The one that's of my doing was my aptitude and my love for going out to sea and mounting expeditions. Every, every part of that, that's something you plan to do, you lay out a plan, it's never gonna actually work that way. You get underway with your effort and you have to adapt and shift gears and try to preserve the outcome that you were after in the first place. And I loved all of that. And I particularly did love being at sea. Uh, and the second that's not my control is the serendipity of NASA starting to select or search for the first batch of space shuttle astronauts at a fortuitous time relative to where I was in my dissertation. Uh, and you know, I first thought, the, I do the bottom of the seafloor, the geology of the bottom of the seafloor. I'm doing it already through 13,000 feet of water. It makes no sense to go 200 miles in the other direction and still try to do seafloor geology. Uh, but a few weeks later, sort of the frame of reference switched and I realized NASA's building a, a space bound research vessel. Uh, and unlike in oceanography where the scientific party gets to go out and do their work or up on a mountain where you, you get to go take your instrument up, in this case, they're getting, they need to put a crew together that can be the proxies, uh, the eyes and ears and hands for research teams that are not going to get to come along. So they're looking for someone that could be partly ship's engineer, if you will, and partly the scientific party. And that struck me as right on the sweet spot of what I most loved to do. Um, the not entirely facetious added point was, you know, we all know the grant cycle, right? You go out in the field, you do your work, you come back, you work up the data, you write the papers while you're writing the grants so that you can have the privilege of going out into the field again the next summer. This would put me in a cycle of never having to do the paperwork in between. I would just go from one expedition <laughs> to another. Right. <laughs> Skimming the cream as far as I was concerned. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's not been my experience with NASA, actually. I'm always having to do the paperwork for NASA. So. <laughs> they are brilliant at paperwork if you're trying to go over the door. Yeah. Sandy, um, you've taken a more direct path to your current field and expertise, but um, have also had to make some difficult decisions along the way and no doubt faced considerable challenges. What is the single most difficult challenge that you have faced so far in your career? Well, it's interesting you should ask that. It's probably not something that people would think about uh, in if they were at all familiar with the things that I've tried to do. The single most difficult thing I ever did was lead a team of engineers and scientists who built really a path-breaking humongous new spectro um, spectrograph for the Keck telescopes. And this was a groundbreaking spectrograph that had, I once added it all up, seven absolutely new path-breaking features that people had never made before. And um, as you build telescopes larger, you have to scale up the instruments in proportion. And so this, these were 10 meter telescopes, um, twice as large in diameter as Mount Palomar, but three times as large um, as uh, the 120 inch, which, which I was familiar. So basically I was now trying to design an instrument that, was, that filled an entire room and I had never built an instrument before. I knew very little about optics. I knew nothing about mechanical design or anything like that. And I was the head of this team. And as many builders of astronomical instruments will know, the only reason you get to start these is you state the cost, you lowball the cost. And everybody is playing the game. You're playing the game, the committee, approving the spectrograph is playing the game. But nevertheless, I knew that I'd signed up to build this enormous spectrograph for about half the money that it would really take. Um, I have a theory about estimating instrument costs. Do your best for two weeks, get a cost, and then double that. And that's actually what it's going to cost. So anyway, seeing this instrument to conclusion, many catastrophes, and many of them due to ignorance on my part, was the hardest thing I ever did. And I take my hats off to the brave souls 
among our astronomy folk who devote their entire lives to making instruments that the rest of us observe with. I did it once and it almost killed me. <laughs> <laughs> so in that, what do you think was the most difficult thing? I mean, you had to come up with this, you had to come up with a number and you had to present this number that you knew was wrong to someone. This seems, all well, of it seems. <laughs> I don't know if I'm answering quite that question, but there was a crisis moment when the spectrograph was together and you should be taking pictures through it. You should be taking spectra. We took the picture and it was horrible. There was something absolutely dreadfully wrong with the optical assembly. Something that where, where the images should have been small, tight and round. They had tails on them. They looked like snakes <clears throat> poking out from the center of the field of view. <clears throat> so, we had a dilemma. Do we take it apart, which would be a huge delay, or do we have our pre-ship review and try to convince the review committee that this was fixable and we'd fix it later? And that's when I had to stand up and make the case that we should move ahead. This is fixable. We'll fix it in Hawaii. <laughs> and then the moment came when we put it all back together again and took pictures again, and it worked. So that was, um, that was a moment to remember, I would put it that way. <laughs> Maybe this is the wrong question to ask, but do you know why it worked when you put it back? Oh, yes, I know exactly what was wrong. Okay. <laughs> uh, as a process, as a part of managing this instrument, I had to learn how to use an optical tool, Snell's Law, uh, called ZMAX, which models optical systems. And so I could tell from the errors in the image, what was wrong? The spacings, there was really nothing wrong with any of the curves on the lenses. It's just that their spacing was wrong. Oh. And I had modeled that, made pretty convincing simulation pictures that matched the real thing. And so when we went to Hawaii, we were much more careful about getting the spacings right. Nevertheless, you can't be sure until it's done. So I was terrified, but it worked. <laughs> Sandy, was this, was this before or after Hubble? Um, this, this was just after Hubble. That's so right. Sp spacing's got you twice. <laughs> <laughs> no, Hubble was a curvature problem. <laughs> yeah, but, but because of the spacing in, in the uh, measurements. Ah, true. That's <laughs> So let's Absolutely. work on this a bit. I'd love to talk about, because Hubble is really where the two of you come together. You overlap here. So Kathy, right. what was your involvement with Hubble? How, how, are you, how are you brought into this story for our audience? Uh, yeah, so I, I come in fairly late, actually. I come in in 1985 when I'm assigned to the shuttle mission that's going to carry Hubble to orbit. Hubble at this point uh, is essentially built, almost completely finished with assembly. Uh, and it's a goodly way through its testing uh, making trying to make sure all the instruments and electronics work. But the problem was uh, NASA had long been promising that H Hubble could work like an observatory on a mountain. It was not a, a astronomy satellite that would work for a while and then it would die and you'd say too bad and build another one. This would be fixable on orbit. You could repair it on orbit. And as technology improved for better and better instruments, you could take the old ones out and put better ones in. So you could keep it alive the, the promise was for 15 years. It's been going for over 30 now. And you could keep it at the cutting edge of technology so it would always be a worthwhile instrument. And that would all be done by astronauts on spacewalks. And the catch 22 was, because uh, they played the same game that Sandy just walked through. So the slice of the budget that was always supposed to be devoted to figuring out how to maintain it and building the tools and equipment needed to do that, it kept getting raided to solve other problems that were more immediate. And so it's 1985, um, it's actually, yeah, late 1984, I'm assigned to it. It's supposed to go up in October of 86 and essentially none of the repair equipment has actually been built. And so I worked for what ended up being five years because of the Challenger accident, making sure we had all the spacewalking tools and equipment and really had the first draft of the step-by-step, -step, how do you do every single task? on Hubble and then flew with the telescope into orbit in 1990. Yeah. So you, you brought up the Challenger accident. And so I, of course, have to ask you, you went up on the Challenger. 
And then you saw, I watched this accident happen. I was in fourth grade and we were watching it because there was a teacher on board and it was a very exciting thing. And, and this is one of my earliest memories really burned into my brain. How, how does that affect you? I mean, as, a, as an astronaut who'd been on that ship, who's gonna go back up again, how did that event change the way that you were thinking about your future as an astronaut? Well, in the short term, what it did was just, you know, throw everything into limbo. Uh, I actually did not see the accident. I was flying back from some work on Hubble in California and learned about the accident when I landed for a flight change at Dallas. Uh, and I mean, personally, physically, humanly, it, it just felt like the entire world stopped dead in its tracks. Uh, I mean, everything you've been thinking about and working on and, and expecting to come forward is just, it has just evaporated. Uh, and you, you don't know where or when it may come back. Uh, then of course there was the personal loss. Uh, four of the people on that crew were, uh, were classmates of mine. So we'd been together since 1978, you know, the families, the kids. Uh, I, Mike Smith was the fifth NASA astronaut. I knew his family pretty well. Uh, most of us knew the payload specialists like Krista and Greg much, much less, but still, you know, there's seven souls lost, uh, five are our NASA family, uh, and, you know, the fleet is grounded for who knows how long. So I think we all spent, you know, a good solid year plus just kind of in limbo as the engineering is getting done, the analysis is getting done, will the shuttle fly again? <coughs> The political impact of that could have been so grave that it grounded the program forever. You just, you just don't know. And you have to just march forward one day at a time, one foot in front of the other, uh, and hope the fog will clear. And then you begin to see what might come out the other end of it. Yep. It did not change. If you were asking, did it change my sense of uh, the risk of flying in space and the, you know, what is the, what's the bother to worth equation? Why do you, why do, you do this? Because there's an irreducible risk that's never going to be zero. So what, what is the value of doing it that in your judgment warrants accepting that risk? Um, if, if anything, it kind of reconfirmed that for me because if, I had, if we were gonna stop flying because of one shuttle accident, then I had really misjudged that value equation in terms of what I felt uh, humans going into space meant for humankind, for our country, for science. Uh, and so I was very committed to, we have to go fly again. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sandy, in a similar vein, but obviously not, not at all the same, um, the, when Hubble went up and didn't actually do what it was supposed to do, how did, you, how, how did that feel to you? What was your reaction and, and, and then plan moving forward? Well, let me rewind just a little bit here and just put myself in the picture the way Kathy did back in, was it 1985? when you joined the program. <clears throat> As it happens, that's also when I joined the Hubble program. I was invited to join the Widefield Planetary Camera Team, which was headed by two friends of mine down at Caltech, Jim Westfall and Jim Gunn. And the team was receiving a gift of 300 hours of observing time in return for all the trouble that the team went to build the instrument and test it and so on. And so th they felt that they needed a little, <clears throat> pardon me, a little bit more science strength on the team. And that's how I got invited to join. And basically I, I sat around during the Challenger delay and didn't have very much to do. Then the telescope was launched in April of 1990. And by that time, <clears throat> my entire instrument team, the wide field camera team, had taken up offices at a nearby university campus about five miles away from Goddard Space Flight Center. And so I was due to take a year's sabbatical away in order to help um, get the camera working and uh, do all the testing and calibration that was needed on orbit. So uh, I was in residence as they started taking pictures and for a long time, they couldn't take a picture because they, the solar panels were flapping, they couldn't point. Finally, they sort of solved that problem, took a picture with our camera. We looked at it and we said, there's something horribly wrong here. <clears throat> and one of our scientists 
stood up at the Daily Project meeting and said, I think this telescope has sp spherical aberration. And the project manager said to him, it's too soon to say things like that. I don't want to hear that. You sit down. And he did sit down. And in fact, he never showed up again. I mean, he was so insulted at being, at being um, uh, sh shoved aside. You ask me now what I was doing. OK, so for much of that time, I was kind of the lead on-site leader of the, of the camera team. And um, we, the camera team, were bugging the project to take pictures with our camera. That was not in the plan. They were not planning to take pictures. They were instead using an interferometer on board the telescope to check the optics. The interferometer gave crazy numbers. It didn't work at all. So members of our team bugged the project. Will you please take pictures? And gradually over a six week period, they took pictures. At our urging, they moved the secondary mirror of the telescope in and out, which is the classic way you diagnose spherical aberration in a ground-based telescope. We had six pictures. Um, my colleague, former graduate student, then postdoc, had learned how to use an optical analysis program, modeled these with diffraction-limited images. We had six model images that looked exactly like the six images that were taken through focus. We presented them at a project meeting at the end of June. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. People just had no, they were in denial. They just didn't want to face up to the problem that this telescope had a severe, really fatal problem. So uh, how did I feel? That was going back to your question, how do I feel? On the one hand, this was the most intense investigative period of my life. Learning about the telescope, understanding the images as they came in, modeling them, making a report and so on. I felt triumphant because we had diagnosed what was wrong with this telescope. But of course, then the other side of the brain felt um, tragedy, a sen an absolute sense of tragedy. And as, as Kathy meant, as, uh, a few minutes ago, you worry when there's a catastrophe in NASA of that magnitude, will the whole program be canceled? Will NASA die? You know, we spun all kinds of really dreadful scenarios as a result of this, such a public failure. And uh, fortunately, there was enough momentum and enough imagination in the project to pick up the very next day with a number of key solutions that were easy to implement and uh, courage and uh, imagination really won the day in the end. But it, it was a dark moment, I'll tell you. Yeah, I guess in, in science and in research, there are often dark moments, but yeah. hopefully they're <laughs> more often than not followed by moments of discovery and clarity where we can make the changes that we need to improve. Um, to that end, let me ask you, Kathy, a little bit about the, the science, the research. I mean, you started off as a scientist. You were doing science, pure science in the deep seas. And I'm going to ask you a question about that in a little bit. But uh, specifically about when you're on a mission, um, you mentioned that you were just an actor. You're a person who's out there doing something else. I, I can't believe that that's all of it, that that's the entire truth. So how much of what you get to do when you're on a mission or what you choose to do when you're on a mission is your own science? science, your own research versus things that are assigned for you to complete? Well, in my case, and this may be a little bit different with crews nowadays that are spending six months on the station, but you know, NASA offers these public assets, the International Space Station or the shuttle, to the world at large. So the, the missions, my first mission and third mission were both Earth science oriented flights predominantly, but the capacity of the shuttle and the crew time was fully subscribed by external scientists. Now, in both cases, uh, one more formally than the other, I signed on to one of the investigation teams on my first mission uh, doing synthetic aperture radar work. I signed on officially as a co-investigator uh, with that team. So I got to get a little closer in on the science. Uh, I didn't take full co-I status on the atmospheric chemistry mission uh, that was my number three, but worked really closely with the, the rest of that team. But it's not, it's not really just actor in the sense of someone hands you, you know, do these 14 steps, you know, 
proverbial, a chimpanzee could do this uh, because we are both the engineer, <clears throat> we're the on-site repair folks, we're the engineering team and we're the science team. And we're you know, present in the moment as circumstances change. So it's really critical that we deeply understand both the instrumentation or the equipment and the scientific, uh, excuse me, scientific objectives of the work so that we can be really the agile part of the adaptation. So for my first life, for example, I spent the better part of two years working hand in glove with the science team, refining their science program and being down in the weeds with the engineering as their instruments were built. So I could completely understand how they worked and how we might need to adjust them or adapt with them while we were on orbit. Um, so it's, you know, I, I liken it to, um, I mean, I think some people feel astronauts are live, live very regimented, unimaginative lives, it's very disciplined, and you know, it's always a checklist in your hand, and that must be very boring. But what that overlooks is uh, I wrote that checklist. I mean, on both my first and third flights in particular, we're, do we're doing things that have not been done before. Uh, and so you're not handed a book to learn and then take a test to show that you learn it you sit down with the investigators and you basically together write the how are we gonna do this book. So to end up in orbit then carrying it out always felt to me more like I was the composer getting to conduct her own symphony for the first time. It's, it's all of your work coming together and to then see it actually you know, blossoming and happening for real is, is hugely fun. And life never does deliver circumstances quite as you planned. So you're always getting challenged to stay on your toes. That's great. I think it's lovely. It's a it's a nice combination of the scientist and the engineer. And you're in charge, but you're you're also doing things for other people. You're part of a team, but you're your own. It sounds like a lot of fun. Maybe I should have been an astronaut. I'm feeling I'm feeling FOMO at the moment. Some serious FOMO. <laughs> That's probably not the right word. Anyway, whatever. Um, <laughs> Sandy, um, I'm I'm also curious. Um, there's been a. a <laughs> I can't formulate this correctly. There's a, there's been a chat in the Q and A from your daughter, your oldest child, who oh, said God. that uh, you you are the kind of person who always has your eye on the prize. So you might not really have been paying attention when there were people or or circumstances that were were necessarily or, or were judgmental of you because of your gender and particular things like that. And that doesn't really matter to you because you wouldn't really noticing. Do you think that's fair? Do you think that's a fair assessment by your daughter of you? <laughs> I think it's completely fair. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I really cannot do two things at once. And so when I'm doing something, I'm really completely focused on it and tend to be oblivious about the nasty faces that people might be making <laughs> around the room if they are. Yeah, I think that I've, you know, but you can imagine that a trait like that at other times is a real disadvantage. So nothing is all good or all bad, but I, my daughter always sums me up. <laughs> I know. Exactly. I imagine that there are situations where it's a real <laughs> advantage, and I'm going to ask you now. Given that you have your eye on the prize, you're officially retired from the university. But as far as I can tell from my interactions with you, you, you never stop working or having your eye on a prize. So, so what is next? What are you looking for next? What is the next thing? Your next prize? Well, I'll tell you what could please me the most. Uh, Actually, I'm doing a lot of science and running a couple with my colleague, David Koo here in the astronomy department. We're running study groups. And in this day of, of Zoom, we, we have daily meetings. We meet every day of the week with a team in China for a couple of hours and so on. So it's, the science is still intense. But I do have a dream and uh, tried to get this going, but only with mod moderate success. It's something called the Earth Futures Institute at UC Santa Cruz. And um, I'd be really interested to hear what Kathy thinks about this. Um, my dad had an expression and he, he actually said two things to me that I remember because he said them many times. First, Sandra, you are fundamentally lazy. That, that was one of the things. And that was only because I didn't like to do the things he cared about, you see, I was, yeah, okay. But the other was, was important and very meaningful. Sandra, make yourself useful. And as I've gone through my career as a, an astronomer and a cosmologist, I do ask myself, what is the good of this? Because uh, astronomy is not a science 
that puts a car in every garage and a chicken in every pot, you know, a la Herbert Hoover years ago. We, we don't make ourselves useful on a daily basis that way. So um, as time goes on, I'm asking myself, what is the good of this science if we really probe deeply and ask about importance over the long term? And I, I do think that astronomy and cosmology are very important because they put Earth in perspective. They, t they have explained, they have written about the first third of the book that leads to us, our existence as human beings, the Big Bang, the galaxy, the formation of uh, the solar system and planets, then Kathy and her gang take over with the evolution of the Earth. And finally, there's you, the biologist, right? To write the, the last third of the book. Uh, it's very important that human beings know that story. It's a shared cosmic myth. And those shared facts provide a platform from us to go forward, evaluate our position and our potential. And potential is what I want to focus on. Where is Earth going? Humans are now in charge. What is the mission? What is the point? And this is a crucial moment in the history of the human species. It's the first time we've ever, A, been able to think about this, and at the same time, obligated to think about this. Because the decisions that we are making today in handling the Earth will have repercussions, ramifications for decades, eons, beyond where we are now. We hold the future of Earth in our hands. So that's what the Earth Futures Institute is all about. It's not just about science. It's not just about economics. It's not just about health. It's about values. And I think our campus is just exactly the right kind of campus to consider values. What is the value of Earth? What is the value of intelligent life? And what are our responsibilities associated with that? So to make a long story short, that's a big project. We could do a lot here on this campus. A lot of people are very interested. Uh, it's a time of fun scarcity at the University of California, perhaps not the time to start a new enterprise. But if I could wave a magic wand and have a wish, we would have an Earth Futures Institute at UC Santa Cruz, and we would be addressing the most important question in the history of the human race. Wow, that's a lot. Right. <laughs> Kathy, would you like to comment about the Earth Futures Institute? I mean, how do you, uh, maybe we can even turn this into a little bit of a discussion about the library. So we want this to be <laughs> part of, you know, the, the, the legacy for, of, the, of the campus and to make this uh, something that we're all thinking about. I mean, how do you see, can you see a synergy between the, the naming of the floors in the library and, and really getting students to think about the future of Earth as well as the future of themselves? I think it's a, this is a moment to, to consider what we want this to be. What do you want it to be? Kathy, you first. Uh, well, I certainly think, I certainly hear a link in what Sandy said to one of the big motivating factors in my career. Uh, you know, look at that backdrop that Sandy's sitting in front of, a spectacular view of the Earth. Uh, I had the privilege of seeing that with my own eyes, from not, not quite the distance that that image suggests. Uh, and you've heard probably every astronaut talk about how moving it is, how sort of illuminating it is about all the interconnections and the, the, that our, our Earth and everything that lives on it is an interconnected system of systems. Getting to that experience as an Earth scientist, I found by the time I was finishing my third flight, uh, I really wasn't I was asking the same question as Andy was, what do I do with this? I've had this amazing experience. What do I do with this? And the, the normal everyday answer is you come home and inspire audiences with you. You've got these fabulous vacation pictures. You, you can dine out on your vacation pictures forever. And I realized that for me, that's not enough because the power of the space-based perspective to help us take the pulse of this planet, monitor its conditions, take those kind of data I mean, we basically can snapshot, snapshot the conditions of the entire planet at once nowadays. 
Uh, it's not quite exactly simultaneous, but it's close enough to. And you take those measurements, you put them in our the computing capacity of today. We are the first generation of humankind that has the capacity for foresight, the ability to predict ahead with actionable reliability, uh, what tomorrow or years after or decades after will be. And so I realized just showing my pictures is not gonna be enough for me. I need to find a place where I, I can help make the connection between this perspective and its power and its meaning and the way we're living on this planet day to day. How can we live uh, more wisely? How can we live more better on this planet uh, if we're informed by those kind of perspectives? So that, that make it matter, how do you make it matter has been, it's been everything of my career since I left NASA in 1992. Uh, how do you tie these things together? Uh, you know, I, I, Sandy, I think you're touching on, on the values and, and the, you know, the ethos and, and the humanity of it all. But, but beyond humanity, it's the ethos of everything uh, that's alive. You know, I think Santa Cruz is exactly the right place to do that. I mean, I look at my own path at Santa Cruz. Uh, I, someone in the Q&A was asking, you know, I started as a liberal arts major, what did that just all fall by the wayside when I switched to earth science? I can't tell you all the ways in which both my languages and world civ, things I learned from Jasper Rose and Mary Holmes uh, and Paige, they have informed and motivated and illuminated and, and added satisfaction to my entire career uh, and, and including my leadership career. I think I draw on those insights all the time. So it has to be that fusion of you know, the deepest human values, the metaphysical as well as human values and the physical perspectives. Nobody does it better. Yeah. And of course, Kathy, you've gone on to uh, quite a, a significant leadership career in government, working for different agencies and leading different agencies. What sort of advice would you give to students now who are starting off in, in any of these paths? Um, either of you, really, um, both women clearly that students can look up to, which is of obviously why we're, we're naming the floors of the library after you so that they can literally look up at your names as they walk inside. Uh, but, but what advice would you, would you give to students who are starting off in this same path? Uh, let me pose that first to Sandy. Uh, easy, go to the library. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally you know what? This brings up something crazy. I mean, people don't go to the library now for the same reason that they went to the library before, because everything is available online. Okay. So why should students go to the library? What, what does it mean to have this science library in the way it is right now? Well, you can go to the library metaphorically or physically. So metaphorically, you should go to the library and become familiar with what's in it, the intellectual content which you can do online, but of course, you really should go there physically. And uh, I just remember the Science Library at Swarthmore College, which is where I got my start. I didn't go there for the books. I went there because my fellow students were working problem sets and I, and I needed to talk to them and learn, learn from them. And it was so serendipitous. You, you saw somebody across the room, you could go talk to them and then for 30 seconds, then you could return to your seat. You know, it was so flexible. You could go outside and play a game of Frisbee when you needed a break. It was a wonderful social gathering spot. And I just could not applaud more our new vision for the science library at UC Santa Cruz and how the wonderful things that the Websters are making possible there. Um, it's a transformation and it's really the way the library should be used. And I'll chime in and just say what Sandy said. I think physically going to a library today is, is because of the value and importance of community and of learning in community. Exactly. Uh, learning in that flexible, real-time fashion from people around you. Mm -hmm. One of my very favorite adages is that the only thing any of us does truly on our own is have the start of a good idea. And beyond that, it takes other people. It takes exchange with other people in conversation to refine it, to see other dimensions of it than the ones that you've perceived initially. Uh, it takes someone to help you fabricate it or build it, you know, bring it to life, finance it. It takes other people in countless ways to really make something of value out of that glimmer that popped into your head. 
Uh, and the, I, the library was the same to me that, that Sandra said. It was a, and I remember I'm a language major that's just changing gears. The old small science library to me was this wonderful, wonderful cocoon. Uh, I, you know, I had a section of books I did want to read because I was catching up on lots of things. I had problem sets to work with my fellow students on. And then it was just a smorgasbord to be able to wander through the stacks and browse and, and let serendipity teach me some things that I wouldn't have known to go search for or ask for. And that's, yes, you can, yes, you can do that via Google, but somebody's structuring, somebody's uh, got, you know, there's an algorithm that's trying to feed you something anticipated when you do that kind of search and wandering via the web. Uh, you've got a very different kind of flexibility and serendipity when you just let yourself explore by your own lights rather than by Google's lights. Can, can I just add a little bit about our library? Um, I am so pleased that my name is going to be associated with a piece of this building because for me, the science library on campus has always been the most beautiful building on campus. And um, I really compliment the library staff and the designers. That third floor, which is farther along than your floor, Kathy, is beautiful. And it's been decorated and graced with many wonderful astronomical images. And I can't think of anything more food for the soul than sitting on that floor, looking out at the redwoods and the beautiful astronomical pictures. We do need some inspiration to get through Snell's Law, right? And uh, this building, I think, uh, not only for community, but also for aesthetics is really an achievement. All right, so before I move on to the, the questions that we've got coming in from the, the audience, I feel like it would be remiss of me not to ask this question, and I don't care which of you answers it, but, and I'm kind of embarrassed to ask, but what is Snell's Law? <laughs> Over to you, Dr. Faber. <laughs> <laughs> when light goes from air into glass or a mineral or some substance that transmits light is not open and is not opaque, water, for example, it bends. And Snell's law tells you the angle of the bend as a function of something called the index of refraction of the first uh, medium relative to the index of refraction of the second medium. So it's the basis of how a lens works. <laughs> it's great. It's just been brought up too many times today to not try to define it <laughs> for our audience here. And for me, I didn't know, don't anyone tell my geology professors from the University of Georgia that I didn't remember what that was because well, I'll be in a big we, we shouldn't. We shouldn't be, um, uh, we, we should be cautious here because this being Santa Cruz, we don't want people to think it's snail's law. <laughs> It would have to be slugs, though, wouldn't it? Not snails. So I don't know. We're getting a little bit away. I'm going to move on now because we're digressing and it might get too silly. So I'm going to move to some questions from the audience. And there's a bunch of them. Not only are there questions in the Q&A, but I was emailed a whole bunch of questions before we got started by lots of people who knew we were doing this tonight. So I'm trying to sort through everything here. I'm going to start with a question for Kathy that brings us again back to the theme of International Women's Day. Um, the question is, I have heard that women, in fact, make better astronauts than men. Is this true? And how do you train and prepare for a mission? And is your training different than what men astronauts have to do? And I particularly like the way that this is phrased, men astronauts. We often hear about women astronauts and astronauts, but here we get women astronauts and men astronauts. <laughs> yeah, so no, there, there's virtually no difference at all in, in the training that's gender related. Um, <laughs> funny. Uh, where did that, what was the first part of that, Beth? <laughs> it was, do women make better astronauts than okay. men? <laughs> well, so way, way back when in the 60s, there was a group of women pilots that were put through the Mercury astronaut biomedical screening barrage. And it was quite, quite a tough barrage back then because so little was known about what the physical and psychological stresses of spaceflight would be. Uh, and 13 of them passed it and passed it very well. Uh, that was a, a pet rock project of a physician named Randy Lovelace. And he thought that women might well be better astronauts in, in part because their metabolic, their physical needs and loads are less. So 
generally smaller frame size, smaller lung volume, less, you know, fewer consumables needed to supply a mission and so on. Um, at, NASA was not thrilled at that point to have find proof that, that women could pass the strenuous exams that, that men had passed to become Mercury astronauts. So those ladies never got a chance to become astronauts. Um, we train the same, we do the same. You know, I'm, I, there's no job that a woman has not done in the astronaut corps now from space station command to space shuttle command to, you know, Peg, Peggy Whitson has the longest duration, uh, cumulative duration of time in orbit of any American at, at over two years. So it's, you know, it's, it's character, personality and technical competency. That makes sense. It doesn't matter your gender. It's just whether you've got the <laughs> the guts to go out in space, I guess. And we'll come back to that question in a moment. Uh, Sandy, what is the most exhilarating discovery that you have ever made? Uh, diagnosing Hubble. <laughs> as far as um, the science is concerned, I think the most important and exhilarating thing I ever did was collaborating with George Blumenthal and Joel Premack. And the three of us back in 1984 wrote a seminal paper laying out a, sort of the soup to nuts picture of galaxy formation from inflation generated fluctuations, dark matter, gravitational collapse, galaxy formation. And that was a wonderful collaboration that lasted several months. We met daily uh, and very, very rewarding. So I'll put those two forward. <laughs> two answers for the price of one. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, um, let's see. I read this one here. Let's see. Ah, one thing that impresses me immensely is the bravery of going into space. How did you weigh the danger involved in your decision to becoming an astronaut? And I'm going to add in there, what is it like to walk in space? Well, I actually paid a lot of, uh, gave a lot of thought to the risk and reward equation before I even filled out the application. Because I figured if, if you think you want to get selected to this, you've got to be sure that it really is meaningful to you. I grew up in an aerospace family. I, I knew enough to know uh, and to have seen evidence of how risky it can be. The other thing though is this is, we're talking the very late seventies and you know, it was a bit rather contentious in the United States at that time, whether it, it was worthwhile to be spending money on the space program. You've got civil rights issues. You've got all sorts of problems on the ground. Why don't we just do away with NASA? We got to the moon, been there, done that, uh, and better spend those funds here on Earth. So I had two thoughts in mind. One is, uh, do you do I feel this, that's tr true about the space program, or do I believe there's value, important value, in the space program? Because you. If you're going to go do this, you're going to need to be able to be genuinely, sincerely all in. Can you do that? Or you, do you have misgivings about the purpose and value? And then, what, however I reckon to the purpose and value, how do you weigh that against the risk? It's, it's human beings doing things no humans have done before. So they will make errors of omission, and there's sometimes be errors of commission. Uh, and I weighed that out and decided this makes sense to me, not for fame and not for fortune, but in terms of the, the potential value to humankind and the value to my country and the opportunity to serve my country, that was the value. Uh, I felt I had a pretty good grip on the kinds of risks uh, and that you know, NASA is a high integrity organization on the whole that works very hard to control and mitigate those risks, but there will still be some there. And I weighed that out and decided it, it made it pass the test. Yeah. And what's it like to walk in space? It's not walking. It's a risk thing. That's why I threw it in there, right? You're taking a risk. You're, yeah. for, for, the, for, the 12, for the 12 men that walked on the moon, it was actually walking. For the rest of us, it's more hand over hand. It's ra rather more like swimming. But in terms of risk, uh, when, you, when you put on a spacesuit, you are basically getting into a body-shaped spaceship of your own. So you're pilot in command of your own single-person spaceship. And you're now separated, you're tethered, but you're separated uh, in terms of life support from the mothership. So that, that's a different bit of risk. Mm -hmm. So how does it feel? It, Do you stay calm? calm? <laughs> uh, yeah, the famous, the famous family story is my father was able to see my heartbeat, my heart <laughs> rate when we were going out the hatch. Uh, and it, he says it spiked to 78 before settling back to 60 as we went on outside. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> That's just bragging. <laughs> it's ready. Let's go. <laughs> So here's another question. Uh, much of both of your experiences, but sorry, not all, have been at public research universities. Sandy, how can we continue to make that opportunity available for today and tomorrow's students? By um, making good use of our tax dollars, having enough tax dollars and making good use of them. Uh, it's really a shame the way state governments have been abandoning their state universities over time to the point where state funding share has really fallen just, you know, to 10 or 20%. So I'll tell a little story. Had one of my students who was struggling to pass the exam. She needed to pass the exam in order to pass her gen ed requirement. In order to graduate, she was the it was the spring of her senior year. She had to pass my class. She had to get a 59 to pass. She did get a 59. But in the process of meeting with me and getting some tutoring, she confessed that she was sending half her student stipend back to her family in LA. And so many of our students are doing this. Uh, and if they can get through school, then they don't have enough money to apply for graduate school. It's a question, are they going to eat or pay the, the exam and the admissions fees? It's just, well, I'm very disappointed at the current situation and the lack of proper support for public education. Here, here. Yeah, I think we can all agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Kathy, here's a question that was emailed to me earlier, which was, um, you have gone both up and very far down. <laughs> and we've heard a little bit about what it was like to go into space. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to go into the deep sea? And, you know, is there a favorite of your adventures or, or not? Yeah, the favorite is that I got to do them both. Um, <laughs> that, there's one similarity and then a ton of differences. This, the similarity, of course, is you can't, you can't be in either of those environments without a, a very well-engineered craft that gives you the, the kinds of conditions we need here, temperature control, breathing gas, things like that. So there's the marvels of engineering are essential to both of them. And there are a couple of technical commonalities between the two, uh, but the big differences are start right away. You go into space, you've gone from the one atmosphere of pressure that we're all sitting in here now to zero. You go into the deep sea, every 10 meters you go down, every 33 feet you go down, you've added another atmosphere's worth of pressure. So at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, it's basically 1100 meters, 11,000 meters, excuse me. So you've got 1100 times the pressure outside the little sphere that you're sitting in that we have here. Um, you're riding a bomb to get into orbit, so it's at just as explosive and intense as that phrase would suggest. And a submersible into the deep sea is a very serene elevator ride. Uh, it was a four hour ride down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. It gets dark from about a thousand feet down. Uh, but you're, you know, you're wearing shirt sleeves, you're sitting dressed like you could be dressed here. As long as you have a little bit of down clothing to put on as it gets colder and colder. Uh, and of course, from orbit, you can see about a thousand miles out of spacecraft window. And in the deep sea, you can only see as far as the lights that you brought with you will allow, which is usually about 30 feet. But there's critters all the way down as you're going down in the deep sea. And there's only the critters that are with you in the spacecraft when you go into orbit. Right. That we know of. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sandy, here's a question about um, uh, things that are coming up. What are your thoughts about the upcoming launch of the James Webb Space Telescope? How will it compare with Hubble? And if you had a choice of launching a new instrument using one of Elon Musk's rockets, would you go for it? Or would you rather work with NASA? Ooh, those are a couple of trick questions that they wrote in there for me to read. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's just stick with James Webb to start with. So what are your thoughts about the upcoming launch of the new telescope and how it compares to Hubble? Maybe how it's different for our audience? Well, the whole astronomical community is abuzz 
uh, with this new adventure, which is more, much more difficult. Bigger telescope, but also farther from Earth and not fixable, has to work the first time, and requires this sun shield, which is the size of a tennis court, to unroll, unfurl perfectly without getting tangled or enmeshed or any of those things. So it, it's going to be uh, a really tense moment to make sure that uh, everything works on that spacecraft. Uh, it operates at longer wavelengths. It doesn't take pictures that are that much sharper than Hubble, although it does at some wavelengths. Mainly it's exploring wavelengths that we've never seen before. And I think the, the pictures are going to be less predictable because the world that you see through, even in my office now, if I had infrared eyes looking at my office, it would look completely different from what it looks like in optical light. So the universe is just going to be unveiled in a completely new and different way. Um, I, don't, for, yeah. don't forget the 18 mirrors that have to uh, fold into shape. Yeah, that's, that's right. And by the way, the inspiration for that was the Keck telescopes, yeah. which were the first segmented telescopes and their technology is now being used for the Webb telescope. Uh, I lost the thread a little bit. Should no, we? that's good. That was a great, <laughs> that was a great answer. Um, Kathy, what is your next adventure? What are you, what are you planning for, for, for next? You know, I, I don't have anything on the horizon of grand adventures, but you know, the deep sea dive was not something I was planning and aiming for. It popped up out of the blue when Victor Vescovo emailed me and said he was going back to the Challenger Deep and thought it was about time a, a scientist and a woman uh, have that journey did I want to go. So you know, who knows what sort of pop-up target might be out there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on the distance, on the hoping horizon, you know, remember John Glenn when he was 78, uh, got to go back for one more ride in space on the, on the basis of collecting some data on how an older body responds uh, to spaceflight. Uh, and so my, my premise is that was some data on one old fogey and you're gonna have to add some data on one old broad at some point. So in about 10 years, I think I get one more ride. Uh, and if the moon happened to be involved, I wouldn't object. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, there, a couple people have asked uh, uh, about your thoughts, to hear about your thoughts about a, a manned mission to Mars. Do you have any thoughts about that as an astronaut? Um, as a geologist, one is I want to go. Right. Um, <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> so, well, but on a more serious level, I, I, am, I am a proponent of a human mission to Mars. Uh, in, yes, in part for the science, and we can get, you could get into the whole robotic versus human observer thing. My rationale is a little different. Uh, I, think what, I think one thing we learned from Apollo, when we set a very, very demanding technical objective, uh, and if you add humans in the equation, the demanding level goes up exponentially. Uh, and so the, the span, the variety, the array of advances in science and engineering that had to be achieved to make Apollo happen was immense. I can't think of any single single mission kind of challenge that's ever catalyzed such a broad front of science and engineering. And the cascade of benefits that flowed back to life here on earth and into industries and into other fields of science has been immense. I mean, Apollo, I think most people don't realize this about Apollo. It marks the point in time when people stopped bragging about how big their computers were and started to brag about how small they were because the guidance and operating challenge of Apollo to the moon required a level of reliability, processing capability uh, at a small size, small volume and small weight that had never ever been achieved before. So it, it catalyzed, it's a good argument that to be made that it catalyzed the scaling up of production of microcircuits, which had only just made lab scale prior to Apollo. Mm. Thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna ask just one more question, I think, before we bring the evening to a close. And I'd like to just bring it back around to International Women's Day and the idea about uh, women in science and really really helping to our, our students and other trainees to succeed. Um, uh, and I'm gonna ask this question to Sandy in her current role as professor, at least Professor Emerita. Um, You've said that there weren't any obstacles, at least that you noticed because you were so busy focused on the prize because of, of your gender. But I'm curious, how has, 
have you changed at all as a mentor as it's become more common for women to be participating in, in your field of science? Do you feel like there's been any, any part of you that's changed as the field has become more diverse? Wow, that's, hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever thought about that. I have a strong sense of myself as being always the same person. And I'm, I'm sure almost everybody feels that way. Um, I, I think um, I have an increased sense of how complicated every activity is. And as a mentor, perhaps am much better at trying to alert my students to the complexities of human organization and the broad array of talents and skills and abilities that it takes to succeed. I think I thought as a younger person and also imparted this information to my students that you had to be smart, you had to be a good scientist, you had to work hard. Now I understand from the perspective of the end of a career that institutions require so much in order to work well. And um, a person, you would like to have a person in your institution who has goodwill for the institution, who has ambition for it, concern for colleagues, uh, tolerance, an understanding of how to solve small problems so that they don't get bigger. In other words, an appreciation of the human element in running the university and being a scientist. I think that's the perspective that has blossomed with me over the years. And it's probably true of most people who have lived as people to the age of 70 plus. <laughs> it's not something that you really figure out at the age of 20, I think. That's fair. <laughs> and Kathy, do you have any parting words? Um, you've been involved with lots of different institutions and also seen this and an incredible change in over your career as far as participation, not just of more uh, of increasing gender participation, but also of people from all walks of life and, and social backgrounds and racial backgrounds. And, and how have you do you have any parting words of wisdom that you would like to bestow on the next generation of people who are looking to follow in your footsteps? Um, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, the road, don't expect the road to be super smooth and don't ask people around you to make it smooth. Part of the roughness is you learning about you and, and growing through your own challenges. Uh, but part of it is just the variety of human nature and uh, the, the a competition among people that's that's fairly natural. Uh, I guess the one thing I would pass along most of all, both to young men and women, is uh, in particular, I think, to, in particular, our culture. Uh, we live in a culture that hypothesizes that the, the best way, the right way, the only way, the way you get really great results out of people is by establishing tension and competition and, and pressure. Uh, that's what it takes to succeed. It's very, it is a very sort of macho testosterone kind of uh, approach. That can be one way to spur people to high performance. It is absolutely not the only path to excellence. It, 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 there just isn't. It, you, can, you can use other styles, other cultures. So if the beat them around the head and ears, brash, harsh, isn't working well for you, uh, strengthen yourself a bit to be a better a little more resistant to it perhaps, but understand that's not a verdict on you. That's, that's someone you've encountered that has one tool that they believe in for driving an institution to excellence. Even if they're of the best possible motive, they only know that one approach. Uh, and it may be they're just a jerk and they're trying to put you off your game and take you out of play a little bit. That happens too. Uh, but uh, don't, don't let people tell you, don't let the world or the institution around you persuade you that you have to be just like some other person in their brashness or their machismo to excel. That's just false. 
Well, thank you. Thank you both again. I think that's an excellent way to end, to remind people that there are lots of paths to success. The path is not always straight, but sometimes it is, and it doesn't matter. You just follow whatever is working for you. And if people are afraid of where you're going to use the bathroom, you tell them that it's none of their business, right? <laughs> so <laughs> thank you both again. This has been a really fun conversation, and I really appreciate you allowing me to moderate. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, Sandy, Kathy, and Beth, for this just wonderful conversation. I feel like I'm a different person after listening to it, Sandy. <laughs> so thank you so much. And stay tuned for more opportunities to participate. Have a great evening, everyone.